Okay, uh, I think uh, we've got everyone loaded in. So uh, again, good morning or afternoon. This is uh, Mark Bromson with Archer and uh, thank you guys all for joining. This is our fourth installment of the Ask the Experts webinar series. Um, first, on behalf of Archer, um, with everything that's going on, we hope you, your family, friends, and coworkers are safe and, and healthy and, and staying that way throughout this, uh, this ordeal. Uh, secondly, on behalf of Archer, um, we want to thank you and your entire organizations for continuing, continuing to operate and literally keep the lights on. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. Today we're going to discuss PRC 27. This standard is really concerned around the, with the proper coordination of protective relays. Um, we're going to discuss any questions that you guys have. So please, as we're getting things uh, kicked off this morning, if you didn't come with questions formulated, start formulating those questions uh, and uh, get ready to either type them in um, or we can ask them live as well. I'll, I'll go through that piece. Um, today I'm going to do a two-minute overview on who Archer is and introduce ourselves. Some of you we've worked with, some of you we have not, so uh, we'll let's kind of uh, fill you in there. Um, if you have questions at the bottom of your screen, there's the ability to either raise your hand and I can uh, make your mic hot so you can ask the question live, or you can feel free to type it into the Q&A section uh, and we'll, we'll answer them real time there as well. Um, so first, let me, uh, let me maybe introduce Archer a little bit. Who is Archer? So Archer is a consulting company that was formed about six years ago by four partners who have spent decades in the utility space, focusing on operations, security, and compliance. Um, the partners all ran large, all ran large organizations uh, within utility companies, um, either building or maturing operational uh, or security and or compliance organizations. Uh, three of the four actually went on to be some of the first auditors in the nation as well. Uh, and while the, while the leadership at Archer really is how things got started and, and have really set the tone for who Archer is, um, Archer has continued to expand its uh, focus by hiring tenured credentialed resources uh, and really continuing to build in our areas of expertise in operations and planning, compliance, physical, and cybersecurity. Um, we work heavily in the utility space, of course, that's where our, many of our roots uh, are, but we spend a lot of time in oil and gas, mining, water, food processing, and other OT-centric environments. Um, we do everything from project work, whether it's uh, assisting on certain standards like this, full audits, to really everything from um, mock audits, gap analysis, to uh, staff augmentation and really uh, at times doing virtual compliance organizations. So that's really who Archer is at a very high level. You can obviously go on our website and reach out to us afterwards as well. Uh, but as I committed to, I wanted to really get to our panelists who we have for today. And I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves and we'll just go right in order starting in the upper left with, with, uh, with Richard. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Shiplett. I'm the uh, OMP uh, Practices Director for Archer International. And um, my background begins with the U.S. Navy. I served on submarines of nuclear, in the nuclear plant as a machinist mate, a mechanical operator. And after uh, six years active duty, got out got back to college and got my engineering degree down in Texas and eventually landed with the Bureau of Reclamation in Washington State at the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, worked there as a senior electrical engineer and uh, spent four years as the compliance manager for SIP and ONP standards before moving to uh, WEC, the uh, Western Electricity Coordinating Council. Uh, worked there as a compliance risk engineer processing self-reports mitigation plans, um, doing some of the early IRAs and ICEs and then moving into the role of an OMP auditor before uh, moving into the consulting arena. Uh, Jim? Jim Turpening here. Um, I uh, started my career a number of years ago working for a public utility company, worked there for 36 years, had the opportunity to go over and work with um, the WECC as a as an auditor for about oh, 12 13 years and uh, resigned from that and picked up uh, with the uh, Archer group and 
have had a great deal of uh, fun and uh, experience working with that group as well as uh, the WEC group. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I hope we can get all of your questions answered. Brian? Thanks, Jim. Uh, this is Brian Heaney. Um, I graduated from MIT in Boston back in the 1980s and uh, spent my first year at Boston Edison uh, doing distribution planning. Um, after that, I moved to uh, San Francisco and worked for uh, Pacific Gas and Electric as a transmission planner for about 13 years doing planning and operation studies and then moved into the consulting world uh, around the year 2000 and have been doing that for the last, oh God, 19 years. Uh, continue to do planning and generator interconnection, but have also been doing uh, NERC compliance since uh, the standards became effective in 2007. Been with Archer for probably about two years now. Brian, thank you. Um, and I see a few more people have joined. So uh, just to, before I turn it back over to Richard, um, for those of you that just joined, we're going to take questions throughout the day. This is really meant to be conversational. Uh, so on the bottom of your screen, you can either raise your hand or in the, in the Q&A section, go ahead and type uh, your questions and we'll, we'll answer them real time. So Richard, I'm going to turn it over to you and maybe start just giving a high level overview of PRC 27 and some of the things that, uh, that you and the team here have seen. So Richard, I'll turn it to you and then we'll go right to some questions. Okay, Mark. Uh, so, many of you probably already know that PRC 27 is a new standard in the uh, NERC regulatory space uh, designed to replace PRC 1, an existing standard dating back to 2007, uh, specifically requirements 3 and 4 uh, dealing with coordination and protection systems. Um, recently, due to the COVID-19 issues, FERC has issued a notice that they are going to uh, change the effective date of the standard from October 1st of this year to April 1st of 2021. Gives us a little more breathing space to uh, get everything up to speed with regards to the transition from our existing PRC1 processes to that to match PRC27. Uh, we're, we see a lot of the same uh, machinations uh, being used uh, from PRC1 uh, in the sense of coordinating those protection systems. But uh, I'm glad to see that this standard uh, is coming into effect in the, in the sense that it, it removes some of that administrative burden uh, that PRC-1 uh, implemented in the sense that uh, PRC-1 uh, left things pretty open as to what uh, had to be coordinated and with whom, uh, perhaps uh, overkill in many respects. PRC 27 dialing that back down to specifically those entities that are electrically interconnected and uh, narrows the scope to those uh, relay elements uh, listed in attachment A of the standard. Uh, so that's a very high level overview of what we're looking at today and be happy to dive into some of the details of those requirements uh, embedded within. So please ask your questions and uh, we'll be happy to respond. Thanks, Richard. Um, I did get some questions on the front end uh, emailed in. Uh, and so for those of you, I'll re reference it now and, and at the end um, on this screen, my email address is on the bottom right. If uh, during or after this call, you have some questions that you want to email over to us, you can always do that as well. Um, so I'm going to throw out the first, I got about uh, what seven, eight questions here. Um, I'm going to just start going down the list and um, even for the participants that are out there, if you'd like us to expand on any of these answers, please uh, don't hesitate. Um, so first of all, uh, do the changes of logic functions in pro protection relays settings require coordination under this standard? So Richard, maybe you want to start it off? Sure. So. Uh... This is kind of an interesting question in the respect that um, logic functions may or may not impact uh, the elements that we're talking about with regards to coordination. Um, logic um, may impact the timing of some of those functions, how they're implemented, how faults are mitigated. And in those respects, we want to consider those uh, when we're coordinating those systems internally and with externally uh, electrically interconnected 
uh, utilities. So I would ask that uh, that would be a good question to pose to your protection engineers um, if, if that uh, logic function uh, impacts those and therefore needs to be coordinated um, both as part of your protection system coordination study and with uh, coordination with those electrically uh, interconnected utilities. Um, Jim or Brian, do you have anything to add to that? No, Richard, that pretty well covers it. Uh, I, especially the, the when you go into the devices that change the logic, the, the protection engineers have to be dealt into that to make sure that it doesn't affect some other part of these multi-complex devices. So getting the protection engineer involved in it is a paramount of importance. Thank you, Richard. Great. Um, Brian, if you have anything to add, please do. Otherwise, I'm going to jump to the next question we got. Um, if we notify another utility that is electrically joined for a facility of proposed relay changes and the entity does not respond within a reasonable amount of time, should we document that no response was received and proceed with the change? Uh, good question. Uh, and this is kind of a carryover from the PRC1 um, standard as well, because uh, coordination or is, is not the same as a notification. Co coordination implies that we're going to have a dialogue of some sort with uh, another entity. So that, re that requires a response. Uh, PRC1 was, or PRC27 has language in it that requires uh, any owners of protection systems to respond to those coordination requests. Uh, but it doesn't give us any timelines to how long that may go on for. Um, it's implied that that coordination occurs prior to implementation of the uh, protection system changes. So it's important that that coordination activity uh, occurs sooner rather than later. Um, in the situation where you don't get a response, hopefully uh, as part of your R1 process, you've identified um, points of contact with those electrically joined entities and perhaps established backup contact means. So for example, you might have uh, an email address from primary point of contact, but then also ones for backup contacts should that primary be unavailable for unforeseen reasons. Uh, having phone numbers for those folks is also important because if you don't get that email response, uh, perhaps picking up the phone and, and getting uh, some sort of voice confirmation uh, as to what's going on with regard to that coordination attempt would be important. Uh, at audit, it's important to demonstrate that you've uh, practice due diligence in trying to establish that coordination. Um, you know, if you go weeks and months with still not receiving some sort of correspondence um, and you're trying to install these new protection system settings, uh, there, after that due diligence is performed, I think you need to uh, you know, make some progress in that regard, but I would make sure that you have sufficient documentation to justify that implementation, uh, that you've, you've made those phone attempts or the email attempts to try to resolve this situation. Jim, Brian? Yeah, I'll go along with that, Richard. In fact, that's excellent. One of the things as an auditor that, that, that will be asked uh, will be to show the communication chain from the, the con at the conception of a project or the conception of the need to make a modification or a change in the system itself and as a rule, what the auditors are looking for is the, the initiating entity is communicating with the adjoining entity and that there is a, a chain of, of communications between the two so that uh, if the initiating entity uh, is needing to make a change, they will communicate with the, the uh, uh, adjacent, and now they call it adjoining uh, entity, and there is a communication established back in the beginning where they can compare uh, not only the settings and the logic that is needed, but they can also make sure, and they should have already done this, of course, is that they're, they're looking at the same uh, uh, impedance for the line, impedance for the system, fault duty, and such as that. And, and that's what 
that's what the auditors were, and what, what we all should just be doing is to make sure that we have the communications between the two entities involved and that there is an agreement or if there is a problem, I've seen it, you know, I've done this for 12, 13 years, I've seen all kinds of issues to where sometimes the one entity does not particularly agree with the other and then there's a dialogue that is established and they work their way through it and they come to what they all agree to is the proper uh, settings and coordination for their protective devices. Uh, so it's very important that, that you have this, this communication. It's very important that you do the communication, but that you also have a, a record of the communications that you've had throughout the whole process of establishing uh, a new coordination or new relay settings, whatever the case may be. Um, so uh, it, you, you need that uh, and you need it uh, recorded so that you can bring that as, as evidence if you are ever asked for it by, a, uh, by an audit. Brian? Oh yeah, I'd just like to kind of add on to what Richard said about the difference between uh, coordination and notification, where notification is a one-way communication, coordination does need to be two-way. Um, this problem is pretty common since the word coordination is used throughout the standards. So this is not the only standard where this occurs. And in cases where I've seen this happen, um, I do recommend going up the chain of command but also uh, kind of gently reminding folks that this is a NERC compliance issue. And if they don't respond, that this could be a compliance problem. And sometimes that'll put the fear of God into people and get to a response. That's all I had. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, maybe a tag on to this one a little bit, but is an email sufficient to demonstrate that the short circuit model data was reviewed and updated? Um, interesting question. Um, I would first, um, as an auditor, look back at the process you developed for your requirement one. Um, requirement one, of course, it requires that you come up with this document that describes how you're going to um, develop new and revised protection system settings, and it has to contain certain aspects. And uh, one point, one of that standard talks to a review and update of the short circuit model data. Um, so obviously, uh, somebody's got to perform that review. Um, I would think that would be part of your uh, R1 process that the, the, as a role or responsibility that would be identified who performs that action. Um, if the email comes back and, and it indicates that um, the relevant portion of your system was uh, short circuit model was reviewed and updated, um, have, it's, it's a dated email, it indicates who that's from and who it's being provided to, uh, I could see that that would suffice. Um, it's possible if, it, if an auditor um, has su sufficient reason to ask question about um, the thoroughness of that because of some other factors that have been um, observed, they might want to see what that review um, entailed. Um, hopefully that's also part of your R1 process, uh, some sort of checklist perhaps or procedure involved with how they um, perform that uh, review and update of the short circuit model to help um, justify or um, um, provide some supplemental information with regards to that review. Jim or Brian? No, well, that's exactly. Uh, you mentioned the word procedure, Richard, and um, I think that's an important thing to remember here, especially for R1. Uh, the, the evidence table for R1 uh, says that they are looking for documentation of the process. So uh, a written procedure would be really important. And as uh, Richard mentioned, uh, you'd also like to have controls in that procedure, such as a checklist to make sure that the procedure is followed uh, every time that it's needed. Go ahead, that, Jim. That's excellent, Brian. Uh, the procedure is of, of a paramount of importance, and that is that it is documented. I uh, can't re reinforce enough the documentation element of that. But uh, no, I totally agree. Very good, Brian. Back to you, Richard. I think that sums it up. Great. 
Um, do we need to provide the short circuit model data during an audit? Interesting. Um, so obviously you um, have to review and update the model uh, when you perform your protection system coordination studies um, and that you have to have this model if you're going to use um, the uh, in R2, the option two, where you're doing the fault current values baseline and then determining if there's a uh, deviation of 15% uh, from that baseline, those fault current values come from that, that short circuit study. So you obviously have to have that, um, whether or not it's, it's included specifically with evidence with the RSA, I would say no, but it's, it's important, of course, to have it in your back pocket to provide if the auditors so choose to request it. Um, but you do need to be able to document that a review, an update occurred of that model uh, for each time that you had to coordinate uh, your protection systems. Uh, Jim and Brian. Well, that's exactly correct, Richard. They, the, 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 the document itself needs to be made available uh, with the dates on it and when it was, uh, was uh, completed. Uh, I don't think I have much more to add to it. Brian? Yeah, I, I, and agree with, I agree with you guys too that I don't think the short circuit uh, data needs to be provided. Um, you want to re refer to the RSA though uh, for the evidence requested table and that will tell you what to provide and also be sure to look at the measures as well because that gives you hints about what type of evidence should be provided. Thanks, Brian. Uh, got a few more questions left. Um, a couple more people joined, so I'll just uh, remind folks, is if, you, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand and I can give you the mic to speak or you can type them in uh, and we'll kind of answer them real time. Uh, so I've got a few more here I'll go through. Um, is there any restriction to changing from option one to two or vice versa under R2? Richard, I'm going to have to ask you to maybe try that again. You're uh, you're very you're really broken up there. I thought it was just my phone, but uh, I'm getting some notes from others. So uh, maybe try that again. Okay, am I coming through clear? Oh, that was a little better. Okay, Go uh, ahead and give it a please let me know if it continues, and I'll uh, dial in on a different number. Nope, that you sound great right now. So go right ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, obviously, we don't want to exceed that six calendar year basis. Um, you want to document when and how you're making that transition. Um, I think it would be the best practice that if you're, say, going from option two to option one, that you go ahead and perform that protection system coordination study again to reestablish the bookend uh, for the next six calendar year basis. If you're going from option one to option two, it's important to establish that fault current baseline um, prior to making that change so that you, you have that baseline from which to uh, judge future fault current evaluations on and establish the bookend for that as well. Um, Jim or Brian, do you have anything to add there? Uh, this is Brian Richard. I, I would just add that uh, for these types of uh, requirements uh, where there is a timeline involved, I like to have a tracking spreadsheet 
that will show the auditor the dates of that uh, each of the studies was done and the elapsed uh, years since the last study was performed. That way, when you provide that as evidence, they can just walk right through it and they might spot check you here or there, but uh, you'll have a very uh, happy auditor if you lay your evidence out that way. Excellent, excellent, Brian. Uh, thank you. Very good. Um, next question. Assuming that FERC does not approve the extension of the effective date, do I need to perform the protection system coordination study before October 1? Uh, fortunately, the implementation plan specified for PRC 27 does not require the protection system coordination study to be performed prior to the effective date of the standard, which is now April 1st of 2021. Um, that states basically that you've, you're, you're given six years from that effective date to perform this first coordination study. Um, however, if you choose option two, that baseline, that fault current baseline needs to be established on or before the effective date of the standard. Excellent. Okay. Um, this is my last question that I've got. Um, so if, uh, if you guys want to ask any more on the Q&A in the top or raise your hand and ask it live. Um, otherwise, once we're done with this question, I'll, go, I'll uh, give each of the panelists an opportunity to talk through um, or just mention anything that they thought was important that they thought probably would get asked today um, and uh, just uh, pontificate a little bit on, uh, on some of the things they've seen at their many client visits. So uh, the last question I have is, if we include processes that go beyond those stated in R1 and fail to provide evidence for them, could we be found non-compliant? Yeah, this question gets back to the, the old, um, if I write something, am I held to it kind of approach. Um, uh, a, a similar case could be made for the old version of PRC5, where you write, write a protection system maintenance program um, dictated well, how you're going to do your maintenance and then you're held to it uh, from the auditor's perspective. Um, in this case, um, I could see uh, where that would apply. Um, specifically, those, those uh, sub-requirements of R1 and how they're met. Um, so if you say that you review and update your short circuit model um, data in a certain fashion, um, the auditor may ask for evidence uh, indicating that you performed it in that fashion. Um, if, you, if your procedure or process goes above and beyond what's listed here in the sub-requirements, I would not expect an auditor to hold you, um, as far as non-compliance goes, uh, uh, responsible in those cases. Jim or Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Well, you're exactly right. This is Jim. You're exactly right. Um, they, yeah, if you go above and beyond the uh, the uh, standards uh, there for R1, uh, the chances of them asking is a very, very slight. The, the, the auditor's philosophy is uh, to accept, uh, but to verify. So as long as uh, you, that uh, the entity is providing uh, to the auditor information that verifies the standards uh, R1 and the uh, uh, subparts of R1, um, I think you're good to go. Brian, you got anything? Nope, I think you guys covered it. Great. Well, thanks gentlemen. Um, that was the last question that I have been sent. So I think uh, at this point, um, what we'll do in uh, participants, you guys all can feel free to continue to ask questions, but maybe we'll just kind of go to kind of start wrapping things up then. We'll go in order of Brian, Jim, and then Richard. Um, just maybe talk about some things that uh, as you see uh, the implementation date coming from, our, from, from one to 27, um, what really what, uh, what 
questions or that you thought maybe were going to be asked and, and really weren't and, and you know, do your favorite topic. So, uh, Brian, I'll give it to you first. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I guess I'm just going to put in a plug for something that I uh, say for almost every standard, which is definitely um, read the entire RSA. Um, there are sections in there that are colored in purple. Uh, one of them is called the Compliance Enforcement Authority section. Uh, we call that the Auditor Checklist. Um, that's the portion of the RSA that the auditor will use to evaluate your evidence. And there's little check boxes next to each item. So you'll want to make sure that your narrative addresses uh, each item on that checklist and preferably in the order that they're listed in that list. So the auditor reads your narrative uh, that walks them right down the checklist. They check off each uh, box on there and you're good to go. Um, it also provides you some information about what they're going to be looking for. Um, I noticed uh, on R3 that um, under the evidence requested table, which is usually right at the beginning of that purple section, um, it pretty much states that the auditor is going to do a selected sample for R3. And it tells you uh, what types of information that you'll provide to them for that selected sample. So uh, take advantage, take full advantage of the RSA. I guess that's my uh, overarching comment on all of these standards. Jim? Thank you, Brian. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the RSA is your best friend when you are preparing for a, a uh, audit for the auditors. Um, I, I, I thoroughly believe we are going to like this uh, PRC 27. Uh, in light of what PRC-1 has uh, given us. It's been a good, PRC-1 has been a very good standard, although there was some ambiguities in there and we had some difficult issues. And I believe this standard is going to be a lot easier uh, to understand and to implement and to track. Uh, if you have any questions, let Archer know. I'm sure we can give you a hand. Richard? I don't have a lot to add. Um... Uh, just speak, speaking to uh, Brian's uh, point about evidence, you know, we've got three requirements here in the standard. The first is what we call a document-based requirement. Uh, so you're basically providing a document to, as evidence that you, you've met compliance. Uh, requirement two is what we call event-based or time-based requirement. And it's just a matter of proving or, or providing evidence that we met or you met the periodicities required by the standard. And then R3 is probably the most difficult because it's performance-based. You now have to perform uh, the processes that you've established under R1 and also under the intervals of R2. And that's where the evidence does get a little bit uh, alumnus with regards to how much you, you may have to provide. Um, and and uh, yeah, I can't emphasize enough checking that um, compliance assessment approach section of the RSA uh, to give you the best um, step forward in establishing what evidence you'll need to provide. Since uh, this is a new standard, there's been no audits performed yet. And so, you know, to some degree, um, uh, we're, we're waiting to see how things will transpire. But um, with the RSA now being published, and um, of course, we have the, the rationale and other information provided with the standard, um, I think we've got a good footing um, prior to the effective date. Mark? Wonderful. Thank you all very much. I don't think we have any additional questions at this time. So uh, with that said, um, to all our attendees, thank you for joining us. We will be posting this recording on our website and we'll send you a link to it uh, at the conclusion. Uh, as I mentioned, you can always email me. Uh, my email's in the bottom right there on the screen. Uh, any questions you have, and I will make sure one of these uh, very uh, intelligent panelists, uh, experienced panelists, will uh, be the ones to answer it. It won't be me, I promise. Uh, thank you guys very much for your time, and uh, we wish you all a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. <laughs>